This is Pass for Two, People and Places, brought to you by Jules Verne, taking you around the world, sharing memories and introducing you to the people at the heart of everything we do. I'm Abby, and in this series, I'll be delving into past adventures, inside stories, future journeys, inspiring you to discover the wonders of the world. Hello listeners, and welcome back to another episode of Passport 2 People and Places, brought to you by Jules Verne. I'm really excited to bring you this episode, as I'm going to be speaking to Pippa. Pippa is a product manager at Jules Verne, and is in charge of putting together the wonderful itineraries that take you on your unforgettable journeys. So welcome, Pippa. Hello, hi, thank you for having me. This is really exciting because I have a funny feeling that we may be talking about a destination that is incredibly close to my heart. Um, But let's see where this takes us. Okay, I'm ready. So first of all, Pippa, a little bit about you. Mm -hmm. Have you been travelling for a long time? Why did you get into travel? What does travel mean to you? To coin a phrase, um, travel means the world to me. I went on my first holiday with my parents and it was a driving holiday and we drove um, from Paris through Switzerland down to Italy and I was amazed at everything I saw driving through the Alps and one of my favourite memories was sitting in a cafe by the beach in San Marino in Italy and having the biggest banana split ice cream I've ever had and I was just like, this is amazing, seeing different people, encountering different places that sparked off my bug for for travel. So was that your first memory of traveling then? If you take yourself back, what is the very first moment that you can think of of, wow, I traveled? I think my first memory um, of traveling was going to the Isle of Wight because that's where my parents come from. And that's where all our family um, are, are based and big family. So we used to go down there every summer at school. So we would get on the ferry from Portsmouth, go across to to Fishbourne, and we'd go to Black Gang Chai, and we'd go to Sandown. So experiencing all that the Isle of Wight had to offer was so different from where I live in in a suburb in London. So for me, it was that created by going abroad was just amazing. There's definitely a common theme, I think, with people in travel, that that flame ignites inside you. Sometimes when you're just travelling locally, you're travelling sort of domestically in the UK, and then you realise there's a bigger world out there. And I think it's a common theme that we've heard from a lot of our guests where they say, oh, my first memory was the Isle of Wight or Yorkshire or Cornwall. And then you go on to these far-flung destinations. But that sort of, that yeah, that flame was first lit much closer to home than people probably expect. Yeah, I think you're right there. Absolutely. You know, the Isle of Wight compared to Hawaii, both islands, completely different, but they still offer something different and unique that makes people want to go there. So we know what inspired you to travel, those early family memories, travelling with your mum and dad. But what inspired you to work in travel? Because it's very different going on wonderful holidays to then actually being in control of creating somebody's wonderful holiday. You are the person who puts these itineraries together and finds the very best places within a destination. You find the very best guides and you kind of create these wonderful memories. So what was the transition for you? What made you think, I'm going to work in travel? Well, I always knew that I didn't want just a a boring desk job. It had to be something that ignited um, an interest for me that's going to make me have a career um, and, and make that career um, worthwhile. And for me, the thing that I loved was travelling. I also liked skiing. So I wanted to work in a, a job that enabled me to, to have both. So I um, started off my career as um, uh, working in brochure production for a travel company, Intersun, um, as it was back then. And then I went to become a product manager for Crystal Ski Holidays. So that combined... Um, my love of skiing and my love of travel, doing a job that I love. I mean, that was just like all my Christmases in one. That was fantastic. So as the person who creates these wonderful itineraries and makes these fantastic memories for our customers, what advice would you give somebody who is planning their own holiday? Well, I don't like surprises. So my best advice is to make sure you plan as well as you can. So do your research, but also when you're planning your holiday, make sure that you plan in enough rest time. 
Because if you don't, you're not going to enjoy your holiday because you are going to be going from place to place to place and not allowing yourself time to one, experience the people, two, experience the culture, and three, have some downtime so that you can actually take a deep breath and go, wow, I'm here. Is there something that you always think I have to pack? So for me, the one thing that I have to pack is my phone because I use that as my camera. So you know, a lot of people will sit there and go, Abby, put your phone away. But I'm constantly taking pictures and videos because I love to relive those moments. Is there anything that you always travel with that you would recommend that other people take with them? Um, Yeah, I mean, for me, um, aside from my phone, because for the same reasons that you've just highlighted, it's the same reasons for me. It's my um, Bluetooth speaker. Because I really do like to be in my room getting ready or sitting on the balcony or wherever I am and having either I'm listening to a podcast or I'm listening to music um, or sometimes it's just so nice just to be able to just chill out and get lost in the moment. Do you have a particular playlist that you always listen to when you're on holiday? Um, I love all sorts of music. So depending on the mood that I'm in, whether it's chill out zone or whether it's... um, 90s rave dance music depending on where I am but yeah no there's loads loads of music that um music that I like that I will always play as well as a travel adapter travel adapter is really handy (laughs) so as we've said you you travel a lot in your work and your personal life is there a particular destination that comes to mind where you sit there and think oh that's home that's the destination that I could just go back and back and back to because there's so much there India Yes. Without a doubt, because you've got the north of India. Such a a cultural um, mix of, of everything that you could wish for. You've got South India, which is a complete opposite of all the tranquility and backwaters. Um... And it's really calm. So you go from frantic to calm. Um, And somewhere in between lies everything else. I mean, India's got 33 states. Each of them has their own cultural differences. Each of them has their own slight dialect on the accent. Each of them has their own food. It's fantastic. So that you never get bored going to India. There's always something that you you see for the first time even though you've been there for 10 times it's an amazing place and I've yet to find somewhere else on this planet that actually matches up to what the people offer in India it's amazing talking of the people is there a particular person you've met then in India for example that you always comes to your mind and has sort of left a footprint on your heart yeah there's there's a lady who um in the golden palace in Amritsar um and it's the, it's the centre of uh, Sikhism. And anybody goes to this um, temple and you have to take your shoes and socks off and you have to wash your feet in a foot bath and you have to have your head covered and you have to wash your hands and feet. And you have pilgrims that, that um, go into the, the, the outer perimeter and they sit and they pray. And there's one lady that walks around and she has a bag of, of dried fruit And it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor or what background you are. It's not about you standing there. It's about the fact that you're here and that we're all sharing in the same love of being here. And she gives you a handful of of dried fruit and nuts. And she doesn't have to. She works really hard. She's she's not, you know, she's, she's poor. And yet she does this because she wants to think that everyone's entitled to be loved and everyone and it sounds a bit crass but it's very true and she really struck her chord with me because it didn't matter who I was she didn't care she, it was just that she was here she shook my hand she kissed my cheek and she gave me some dried fruit I think that's really true of India though isn't it I, I think for me personally India is probably one of the places in the world where I feel so welcome I think that sort of translates to our clients and our friends. Everybody who sort of goes to India may have this preconception. And I think people sit there and think, oh, gosh, it's going to be loud and it's going to be noisy and it's going to be smelly and it's going to be colourful. And it is. It's loud. It's noisy. It's smelly. It's colourful. But in the best way. Mm. And I'm sure our listeners have heard me say this before multiple times, but it's an assault on the senses, but in the very best way. And I think... 
for you as someone who gets to create these wonderful itineraries to India, it must be so exciting, but also so humbling to be able to give back to the people behind the place that you're visiting. Absolutely. It's, you know, I've never been more humbled than going to India because um, the the people, um, it's, it's in their nature to be respectful. And that's what it's about. So you could be walking down Heritage Street in Amritsar and you've got a Sikh temple, you've got a Hindu temple, you've got a mosque, you've got a Catholic church, um, all living side by side, people visiting side by side. There's no angst there. There's no there's no ownership there and there's no right to be there. It's everyone coexisting equally and are happy to be there. So they have a respect for everybody um, that I haven't seen anywhere else. And this is what I'm saying about the people. They really do make you look inward to yourself and think, you know, this is absolutely as you should be. You should be living side by side and happily with your your neighbour. That doesn't have to be an argument. And that's what they do. And yeah, for me, I think it's it's a it's a privilege to go and experience that. So slightly outside of India, for example, um, because you can clearly hear your passion for it, you can, you know, and you see it with the wonderful itineraries that you produce. Um, but outside of India, is there a place where you also have those lasting travel memories, or has India really just captured your heart and and then sort of encased it in a hug? Um, India has, and it will always be the top. Um, I loved Thailand. Um, you know, visiting there, but that's that's slightly different to to, to India. I loved going to um, America, and I liked um, you know going down Route One from San Francisco down to San Diego on the coastal road in an open top car. It was fantastic, and I'll never ever forget that. I loved going to Hawaii, which is completely different um, from what anything you'd expect. It's it's just amazing. There are so many different places that I've experienced. But India always comes out on top for me. Yeah, and I'm I'm lucky that that's the job that I do. Another one of the, the wonderful places I've been to um, is Brazil. And um, flying into um, Rio de Janeiro and looking down at Copacabana Beach as you fly in is just amazing. You know, Rio is just, as you would expect, it's like full on, it's crazy. And then you go to the Amazon and it took us a day to get into the heart of the Amazon Um, and it was by plane, it was by boat, it was by another boat, and we ended up on this floating lodge in the middle of the Amazon. Um, but one of the most amazing things on on this trip was that we were going down one of the Amazon tributaries where we were seeing, like, pink freshwater dolphins, and as we were coming out of one of these tributaries onto a, a major tributary, um, we could hear this music, and I was like, where's that music coming from? And as we literally turned a corner, there's, there's a boat, this is classes their village shop basically selling coca-cola and crisps and and what have you blaring out radio gaga from queen and i was like this is the most surreal (laughs) place i've ever been to and and we got off the boat and we bought crisps and coke and sat on the bank and listening to radio gaga in the middle of the amazon i mean it, it was incredible but yeah absolutely amazing so who did you go on that trip with them with? Who were you sitting on the side of the Amazon eating your crisps and drinking your Coca-Cola? Was that a work trip or was that a personal trip? That was a personal trip. That was with my husband before we got married. And controversially, is your husband your ideal travel companion? Or if it could be a celebrity or anybody in the world, who would you pick as your ideal travel companion? It sounds a bit crass, but I would stick with him. Basically, because, you know, he knows me so well, but I don't have to think, you know, it's just like anything that funny that happens while we're, we're traveling around. You just, you know, he's, he's the companion that you want to be because he will always look after you if you get stuck. But also he'll let me lead because I will I do this as a job. So I tend to get a little bit bossy on holiday. <laughs> so he will he will allow me to take control and do that. So it works really well. And do you find that you you lead in more countries than than others? So do you find that in India you are essentially your own tour guide or do you always rely on those expert guides to take you in those destinations? So I've recently come back from a work trip to India. Um, and as much as I like to think I'm an expert in 
all things India, when you get out there, you know that you're not an expert because you've got the local guides that give you all the history. So it's both. It's me taking the lead of what I want to do and then employing and using all the expert guides that are available to help me understand more about what I'm doing. And has there ever been a moment where a guide has surprised you or have you ever been in a destination where you you thought you knew what you were seeing and then they said, actually, we're just going to take you here for five minutes and you get to see something wonderful or you get to try the most wonderful food or drink. Or I remember being taken to the Oberoi Hotel just as the sun was setting to have a glass of champagne that I didn't realise I was going to do. And I just remember it being one of those moments where I was like... Wow, seeing the Taj Mahal, you know, out the corner of my eye and having a lovely cold glass of champagne at one of the most luxurious hotels. Mm. It was just a breathtaking moment. So have you had those moments where even you, the expert in planning, can still be surprised by the wonderful locals? Do you know, um, I went on my recent work trip, um, we made a, an unscheduled stop at um, this small family-run hotel. And it's something that we're looking into to using for one of our future tours. Um, and it is literally um, owned by a, a, a husband and wife. The mother lives there. The children lives there. You live there while you're on holiday. And you know, the, 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 the grandmother will, will pray at a small temple. That's one of the rooms um, right opposite a, a guest room. Um, you you eat with the family and it sounds a little bit too um uh intimate but actually it's like it's like going to a bed and breakfast um so you've still got space to eat you've still got your dining room and it's big enough but you're part of the family life as much as you want to or as little as you want to um and it's in a residential area in Jaipur and um it was just I was blown away by how these people invited strangers into their home to share their life with them for a short period of time. But, it, you know, lots of people want to do an immersive experience. But to me, this was truly understanding and getting to stripping away the layers of, 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 um, of what could be commercially, could be done commercially and actually getting into under the skin and showing the real India. And that really surprised me because they genuinely were welcoming everybody in. It was amazing. Are there any destinations around the world or again in India where you've been humbled by nature? You've mentioned that you were sitting in the Amazon. You've mentioned that you've gone fishing. Have you seen tigers in India? Have you seen bears? Have you seen elephants in Thailand? What's your relationship with wildlife when you're traveling? I've been to India a few times and it never ceases to amaze me how... Um, the locals just coexist with the wildlife that's there. India has put in a lot of um, time, money and resource into their national parks. Um, and I went to Ranthambore recently. And Ranthambore is a huge national park, but only 16% of the national park is open to tourists. That's how much they want to conserve and have the um, wildlife survive and flourish over and above the tourism that brings in the money, of, of course. So for me, I was unfortunate that I didn't get to see a tiger or a leopard when I went on my safari to Ranthambore. Um, yet the lady that morning who I shared a jeep with had seen... <laughs> A tiger, three cubs and a leopard, which I thought was very greedy. However, um, I didn't get to see that. But it, nonetheless, you know, that just being, you know, it makes you feel very aware of the force of, of uh, Mother Nature in terms of how the environment is catered for the animals. We are just here as a moment in time. Those animals have been here for, for centuries. So we should be very honoured and privileged to, to actually see them. So as much as I was sad not to see a tiger it's their environment and I'm invading their space so I'm quite happy to know that I've been there where they have been and maybe one day I'll be lucky but who knows 
And it's not just tigers, is it, in India? A lot of people think of Rathambore and think of In Search of the Tigers. But there are other areas in India where you can really have a true safari experience. Mm, you can go to Sariska um, and there's there's um, other wildlife there. There are also um, places in um Rajasthan, uh, rural Rajasthan, for instance, is one of our tours. You've got bird life sanctuaries. The, the, the abundance of bird life is is um, phenomenal. Um, I couldn't even begin to list um, the, the different species that you can find. You can go on our cruises. And again, if you go at the uh, Assam and Bahmaputra cruise along the river there, I mean, the, the amazing wildlife that you can see there on the riverbanks, which is, you know, you're in your... your um, your river cruise and you are cruising along the river and just waking up in the morning and just seeing you know the 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 wildlife coming to to drink at the edge is it makes you really aware of how insignificant you are and how important they are definitely Along the banks of any river, I really do think you see local life. If you take how important rivers are around the world, if you think of the Hooghly in India, you think of the Ganges, you think of the Nile, the Zambezi, the Amazon, they are so important to local people, local life, tourism and wildlife. I think it's probably one of the best ways to experience uh, any country, isn't it? Any destination with just a sort of a slow river cruise and, and seeing life from the side of the banks of the river. Definitely, yeah. I mean, you you can go to Kerala and go on one of the um, houseboats and cruise the backwaters. And that's just the backwaters in Kerala. Um, and what you'll see there is you'll see everyday life continuing and not even giving you a second glance because, you know, they've got their their daily life to to do they've got a family to feed they've got work to do but you'll just cruise past them unobtrusively which is the best way because you're getting a glimpse into another life that you wouldn't necessarily see when you're driving around frantically from one expressway from from Delhi to Mumbai for instance because you don't see that but when you're just there taking a moment in time it's it's you know it's beautiful I think another way to sort of see life untouched shall we say is from a hot air balloon yes it is it's probably one of my favorite experiences that i was lucky enough to have in india um but i think a hot hot air balloon anywhere in the world is is one of those experiences where you just go up you feel completely calm it's so tranquil and you're just looking down at wildlife at people at houses at, at communities it's um it's yeah absolutely amazing and you can do that in india in a number of places yeah you can jaipur is probably the most famous one as is um maybe taking um a, a flight uh, over the Himalayas as well, which is a, an amazing thing that, that I want to do. I've yet to do that. It's definitely on my bucket list. Hot air ballooning is, fa- is a fantastic way to see a city, um, especially in Jaipur, because there's so much to see in Jaipur. You've got the, the main town and then you've got Amir, which is um, about 15 minute drive where the palaces are. Um, and to see that in the morning with the mists rising and, you know, everything's coming to life it is um, a surreal moment. And, yeah, I would thoroughly recommend it. So these amazing experiences you've had throughout your career and throughout your life, do you think that travel has changed you as a person? Oh, massively. I think I've become much more um, patient and much more tolerant because when you are lucky enough to go and see different cultures, you'd be very, very ignorant not to take on board with you when you, you know, when you go home, at least some of, of what you've seen. Um, and it doesn't matter where you go, you know, people welcome you um, and you should be prepared to welcome people back. And I'm not just saying when you're away, I'm saying when you're at home, you should start to to, to live um, by these sort of practices. And I think, I really believe that. So you treat people as you want to be treated and be respectful. So you go into somebody's um, local town and you should be respectful of that. And likewise, when you come home, you should treat people um, the same way. So yeah, it's made me, it's opened up my horizons. It's, 
it, I see people in a different light. I, I know as the older I get, the more I want to experience more diversity and and experience more more cultural tra- changes and see you, how you can bring that and implement that into your own life. So what's next then? So you've just come back from India, but where is next on your list? What's the next destination on the bucket list? Uh, Costa Rica for me. I've never been. I really, really want to go. I want to see how much they've they've um, invested into their their infrastructure because now their wildlife is their their key. You know, it's their king. That's what they that, that's what they want to show off. That's what they want to do. But preserve it as well. So I think that'd be an amazing trip to go on. Definitely. Costa Rica is definitely one that uh, gives you absolutely everything. Amazing culture, amazing food, amazing flavours and wildlife is just incredible there. Mm. Um, yeah, it's definitely, I think, on a on a bucket list for a lot of people. So Pippa, I've really enjoyed talking to you about all the destinations that you've travelled to, but obviously most of all India, especially if you've just come back. Those memories are so fresh. But I'm going to ask you the question that I ask everybody who joins us on the podcast. And I probably can guess where it's going to be. Um, But I'm going to ask you, where in the world has captured your heart the most? And why did it capture your heart? Well, that's easy. It has to be India. Um, And as you know, um, I've just come back from my trip uh, recently. And what really captured my heart was I did a five senses tour um, of new and old Delhi. But the difference was that it was much more immersive so you actually went to a community, a women's community shelter. And what these women do, they uh, create crafts and sell them to give back to the community. And for me, that really touched my heart because one, being female, two, India, it's hard to be female. In India, it's hard to be female sometimes. And when, you know, you haven't got the the earning potential that you otherwise might have in the Western world, You know, they have to be protective of one another and it's a safe place. And these these women, um, I I have to say that was probably the most humbling experience I've had because, you know, they want for nothing. They're protected, but they're living on on the bare minimum um, and they're creating stuff to sell to give back to their own community. And for me, I was I was honoured to be and privileged to be able to go and take a glimpse of, of what they do for their community. Pippa, thank you so much for sharing your amazing stories and your wonderful memories, um, especially all about India. I think it's a really special destination to a lot of people, but I think you've given us a really good insight in what else there is to do outside of just your golden triangle. Thank you very much for having me. It's been um, a real delight to, to share my stories and I hope you've enjoyed them. We hope you've enjoyed the latest episode of Pass for Two, People and Places. Look out for our next episode, where we'll be talking to more guests about the people and places that have inspired them the most. We'd love to hear your feedback, so please do get in touch. Thanks for listening. (laughs) 